الحمد لله يا رعاك ما حمد له وجميع خلقه كما يحبه ويرضى اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأكرة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاة سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أسمع بهم وأبصر يوم يأتوننا لكن الظالمون اليوم في ضلال مبين وأنذرهم يوم الحسرة إذ قضي الأمر وهم في غفلة وهم لا يؤمنون إنا نحن نرث الأرض ومن عليها وإلينا واذكر في الكتاب إبراهيم إنه كان صديقا نبيا إذ قال لأبيه يا أبت لم تعبد ما لا يسمع ولا يبصر ولا يبصر ولا يغني عنك شيئا يا أبت إني قد جاء فاتبعني فاتبعني أهلك سراتا سويا يا أبت لا تعمل الشيطان إن الشيطان كان للرحمن عسيا يا أبت إني أخاف أن يمسك عذاب من الرحمن من الرحمن فتكون للشيطان وليا قال أراغبا أنت عن آلهتي يا إبراهيم لئن لم تنته لأرجمنك واهجرني مليا قال السلام عليك سأستغفر لك ربي إن إنه كان بي حفيا وأعتزلكم وما تدعون من دون الله وعده ربي عسى ألا أكون بدعاء ربي شقيا فلما اعتزلهم وما يعبدون من دون الله وهبنا له إسحاق ويعبدون وكلا جعلنا نبيا ووحبنا لهم من رحمتنا وجعلنا لهم لسان صدق عليا First of all, we give our praise and our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on us and we send salat and salam on his last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we continue with the tafsir of Surah to Maryam we are currently on verse 38 we have seen the entire story of Maryam from the initial stage of her becoming pregnant until she got the child, she got Jesus salam. and after that her confrontation with the people as she walked in front of them following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command not speaking to them but for ilai, but just pointing towards Jesus salam, and then he started to speak Allah inni Abdullah atani al-kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya 
وجعلني مباركا عينما كنت وأوصالي بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا عصيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا This was a speech of Jesus A.S. Conforming that he is a prophet Conforming that he is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Conforming that there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Also telling the people of the things that he was commanded As well as the command that he was given towards his people That is to pray salat and to give zakat and so forth And after that Allah says this is the real story, Qawl al -haq. This is the true story of Jesus A.S. So as there might be many different narrations, many different people might have their different versions of the story of Jesus A.S. Allah is telling us, Qawl al -haq Allah says, this is the truth. The way how I have explained it, as the way Allah has mentioned it here in different steps, Allah says, Qawl al -haq, this is the truth, this is how it happened. So when we want to know about the story of Jesus alayhi salam, we should go to the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what really took place with Maryam alayhi salam as well as Jesus. And then Allah tells us that Jesus alayhi salam was preaching to his people. Why he was preaching to them, he said, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abudu. So Allah is my Lord, Allah is your Lord. So worship him. Hada suratul mustaqeem. This was the main gist of his da'wah to his people. So all the time he was preaching to his people, the main gist of it is, Allah is my Lord, Allah is your Lord. So you should all, we should all worship Allah. Don't worship me. Worship Allah because this is the straight path. But then last week we dealt with Allah says, فَاخْتَلَفَ al أَحْزَابُ minhum. That is the different sect amongst them started to differ. Some started to claim that He's God. Some started to claim that He's the Son of God. Some started to claim that <coughs> Maryam alayhi salam, she is an adulteress and speaking is about only sorcery. The only way he was able to speak is through sorcery. We, some of the opinion, some went to the opinion of having the Trinity. And like that, there were so many different. But there was one group who believed the truth. And those who believe the truth that Jesus was a prophet because those who were present at that time listening to what Jesus was saying to his people as a baby. So they knew that he's not God, they knew that he's not the Son of God, they knew that he's not three in one, one in three. They knew that. But because of them being a minority, Many of them were killed. So they were killed so that their opinion would be suppressed. And it's only after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to revive that opinion that those few who were killed had about Jesus alayhi wa sallam. But Allah says, فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا مِنْ مَشْحَدِ يَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ Which is the verse just before, verse 38. Allah says, woe to the unbelievers on the day, the great day that they'll have to meet Allah. On the day of judgment, when you have to meet Allah and the truth will be disclosed. The truth will be in the open. On that day, then they will realize that all the different opinions they had, all those different opinions were not correct. All those opinions were wrong. And we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not punish them immediately. Because up to today, there are people with those claims. But yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He grants them time. And with His time, there is a form of Allah's rahmah, Allah's kindness towards us as human beings. 
and he grants us time for us to use our akal, for us to use our intelligence, and for us to use our intellect to understand what is truth and what is false. Now in this verse is a continuation, Allah says, Asmi' bihim wa absar yatunana. Allah says, listen to them and watch for them the day they come to us. So one of the translation is, listen to them and watch for them the day they come to us. That is, on the day of judgment, you're going to hear the Christians and the unbelievers singing a different tune. Because on that day, they will know that their whole life was lies. Their whole lives were filled with falsehood. So on that day, you'll observe Allah says, you will listen to them and you will see. You will see their cries, Yawma Yaktunana, on the day they meet us, on the day they are brought to us, which is on the day of judgment. The other meaning of Asma Bihim Wa Abusir means that they will hear the clearest on the day they meet us. Right now, the hearing has, has not been clear, has been fogged up. Their sight is not clear because the truth is right there and they cannot hear the truth. The truth is right in front of their eyes and they cannot see the truth. But Allah says, Asma wa abusir, Asma bihim wa abusir yawma yatunana. So on the day yatunana, the day they have brought to us, they are going to hear the clearest. The day that they have brought to us, they are going to see the clearest. Because then is when they will know the truth. So there are not going to be no doubts on that day, the day that they are brought to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الْمُجْرِمُونَ لَا كِسُورُ أُوسِهِمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ رَبَّنَا أَبْصَرْنَا وَسَمِعْنَا فَرْجِعْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا إِنَّا مُقِنُونَ Allah says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الْمُجْرِمُونَ Allah says, if only, if only you could see the guilty ones under their judgment. If only you could see the guilty, the mujrimun. نَا كِسُورُ أُوسِهِمْ إِنَّ رَبِّهِمْ They, on the day of judgment, Allah says, نَا كِسُورُ أُوسِهِمْ They are going to lower their heads out of embarrassment, out of being shame of what they did about their beliefs and their actions in the dunya. So Naki Suru Usihim, they're going to bow their heads in the Rabbihim in front of their Lord. And as they bow their heads in front of Allah, Rabbana Abusaruna Wasamehna, they will say, Our Lord, we have seen now. Our Lord, we have seen now. In the dunya, even though you give them the Quran, <coughs> still they don't want to accept. On that day, Allah says, as they lower and they bow their heads, they are going to say, Rabbana absarna wa sami'na. Our Lord, we have seen wa sami'na and we have heard well now. Now we understand what we were hearing before. Farujna wa la return us. They went back to come back to the dunya. Na'mal salihan The reason they want to come out to the dunya Na'mal salihan So that they can do good deeds They want to come out to the dunya now To be Muslims They want to come to the dunya So that they will be <coughs> believers And they will follow The true story of Jesus Inna muqinun Certainly we are certain now Now we have that certainty that Jesus is not God. Now we have that certainty that you alone is our creator, you alone is our God, you alone is our rock. They're going to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send them back. <clears throat> so this is when they're going to say these words when they realize that their beliefs can't benefit them. When they realize that <clears throat> 
there's no way they can escape from the adab and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I realize that <coughs> Allah says, Asma' bihim wa abasir yawma yaktunana. They, how great they will hear on that day. How great they will see on that day that they have brought to us on the day of judgment. But Allah says, Lakin al-dhalibun al-yawma fi dhalalim mubin. Allah says, but, lakin means but, dhalimun al-yawm, the wrongdoers today. That is on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, crying to come back to the dunya. On the day of judgment, they're going to, they're going to hear the clearest. They're going to see the, the, the clearest. But Allah says, lakin al-dhalimun al-yawm. Allah says the wrongdoers today, the wrongdoers in the dunya now, the wrongdoers who are alive today, they are in com they are completely lost. They are in clear misguidance. They spend their life in misguidance. So why do you find one group who sometimes claims that they are affiliated with a religion? Yet they follow shaitan because they don't go to their religious places even though they say, you know what, some might say I'm a Hindu, I'm a Christian, we even have it amongst Muslims they might say I'm a Muslim but yet they do not practice their religion so they end up following their desires and whatever temptation shaitan places to them, they follow that but yet you have another group which are those who try their best to stay away from shaitan and follow their religion. So you have some Hindus who are going to make sure that they follow the scripture, whatever the scripture says, they're going to be following it. They're going to be spending their life trying to be, as you could say, a proper Hindu or a practicing Hindu. There are some Christians just like that as well whom every Sunday you see them, they dress up and they go into their church, they want to practice their religion to the fullest. But Allah says, all of them, both, those who are claiming that they are practicing their religion, as well as those who have gone and followed the shaitan on the other side, Allah says, feet on the movie. They're all in the wrong, they're all in open misguidance. Because even though they are so devoted, they're not following the correct thing. Their beliefs are wrong. And if your belief is wrong, even though you put in so much of sacrifice, because there are many people out there who are putting in a lot of sacrifice to uphold their religion. Sometimes you see some of those Christians, they are walking in a hot, hot sun, visiting every single house. Every single house. You could be Muslim, Hindu, Christian, different type of Christian. They still come in and call you out. And but they are doing that, they are putting in that effort. But Allah says still feed Allah the Mubin. Allah says they are still in their clear wrong ways. Because their iman is not right. They are not believing in the correct thing. Imagine to have those same type of attitude and you are a Muslim. Think about the amount of benefit that you can gain from that. If you become Muslim, and you have that same kind of type of energy in wanting to give out the haq and the truth. Think about how much Muslims, you, how many people might even accept Islam through you. So Allah says, even though on the day of judgment, their tune are going to be different. Right now, they're singing a different tune as well. With their different types of belief. The next ayat, Allah says, وَأَنذِرْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَ Warn them of the day of regret. Warn them of the day of hasra, the day of regret. إِذْ قُلِيَ الْأَمْرُ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ When the matter will be concluded, yet they are heedless and they do not believe. So Allah says, Warn them of يوم الحسرة Yawm al-Hasra is the day of regret. That is the day of judgment. This is one of the names of the day of judgment. Yawm al-Hasra.
and it is called Yom Al Hasra, the day of regret, because every single human being are going to be regretful on that day. Both believers as well as unbelievers are going to be regretful on that day. So it is a day of regret. Be it if you get Jannah or you get the fire of Jahannam, you're going to, still going to regret. Because Allah says, Yom Al Hasra. Allah says, it is the day of regret. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says, when a person enters into Jannah He's not going to regret anything except Except, there's an exception which means there's something that he's going to regret He's not going to regret anything Except the time spent without making victim Except the time spent without making as you enter into paradise and you see the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you, you're going to regret, you know what? I should have read two more Akan Salat. I, could have, I should have read some more Quran. I should have done some more dhikr so that I could get more. So you're going to regret not using your time more wisely than you did. Because if you get Jannah, definitely you are successful. But when you see of what you have gained in paradise, you're going to tell yourself, you know what, I could even get more than this. If I had really put in somewhere, a little bit more, I would have get a lot more. So you're going to still be in Hasra, Yawm al Hasra. Whereas the unbelievers now, they're going to be regretful that they did not even get paradise. They're going to be regretful that they did not become believers, they did not become Muslims. So that is going to be their regrets. So Allah says, وَأَنْذِرُهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ Allah says, warn them of the day of regret. He did not say warn them of the day of judgment. He could have said warn them of يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ But He says, warn them of the day of regret. Let them know that a day is going to come that they are going to regret their actions. Let them know that a day is going to come that they are going to regret their beliefs, what they used to believe in. Let them know that. Let them know that there is a day that they are going to regret when they see the fire of Jahannam and being thrown in the fire of Jahannam. And Allah says, when is that? It's Qudi al -am. The day of regret is when the affairs have been decided. When the people are going to be sorted out as you have the Jannatis on one side, the Jahannamis on one side. And you're going to have the people of Jannah entering into paradise, and you're going to have the people of Jahannam not entering into the fire of Jahannam, but thrown into the fire of Jahannam. Because if you see fire, you're not going to walk into fire just like that. There are angels who are going to be stationed there to lift you and pelt you in the fire of Jahannam. So when that is decided, Allah says, Yawm al Hasra, that is considered to be the time of regret, where you're going to be regretful, Yawm al Hasra. For whom feel And even though <coughs> that is the day of regret, <coughs> Allah says, For whom feel yet they are heedless. No matter how much you tell them about the day of judgment and the day of regret, Allah says, for whom? Feel gafla. They are going to remain in their gafla. They are going to remain in their heedlessness. They are going to just continue to live how they want to live. They are going to live their life how they feel like to, even though they have to die one day. Even though as days pass, they are getting closer to Yom al Hasra, they are getting closer to the day of regret. Yet, they are not changing their lives. And this is for believers as well. Sometimes <laughs> we have our Iman, we are Muslims. And sometimes we come for Jummah, we listen to but sometimes we don't pray Salat. 
on them is only Juma alone we pray. Even though every Friday we're hearing something admonishing us to be better people. Every single Friday you're hearing that. And you know each a lot of Muslims recognize the importance of Friday. So even though they, they don't pray the whole week, they know, hey, this is Friday, this is Juma, I have to go much. So that, that sort of significance for Friday is embedded in them, that it have to come Friday. And it so happened that Friday is the day that Allah has given us to give an admonition. So just as how here Allah is saying, وَأَنْذِرُهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ Admonish them, warn them of the day of regret. And the reason of warning them of the day of regret is so that they will change their lives. And every Friday as they come, they listen to admonitions. Because every single kubbah will admonish you, either encouraging you to do good for Jannah, or ask you, or is warning you against your evil deeds, so that you will change those evil actions so you will be protected from the fire of Jahannam. And yet, still, there's no change. Allah says, Wahum fi Bafla. Says they are still heedless. They are still heedless. So even though they are coming Friday as well and they are listening to the admonition, they go back and the whole week is just as normal. They just live their life as normal again when Friday comes. Hey, Juma, I have to go mansion. Come mansion again. A full week. Nothing again. For whom feel gafla? Even though they are getting this admonition, Allah says, For whom feel gafla? They remain in their neglectfulness. For whom like Miron, Allah says, and they do not believe. Speaking about those Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. After hearing about Jesus Salam, the true story, after knowing everything the correct way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned it, Allah said, Bahum like they still will not believe. Even if you give them the Muslim version, there are some who have accepted Islam after reading the Quran. There are some of them. There are many Christians who have reported as you could say and embraced Islam from amongst them even pastors and preachers who have left the arena of preaching their Christianity because of seeing the truth in Islam and has accepted Islam but majority of them Allah says like you know they're not going to believe they're going to remain <clears throat> with their neglectfulness they're going to remain with their own beliefs that they had. <clears throat> Allah tells us in the next there's a hadith by Abi Sa'id al Qudri anhu. He says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ida dakhla ahl al Jannah al Jannah wa ahl al Nar al Nar that when the people of Jannah enters into paradise and the people of Jahannam enters the fire, the Jahu will mount, death will be brought. Death will be brought so that both will see, the Jannatis will see, as well as those in Jahannam will be able to see, Ka'annahu Khabashan Amla, as though it is a handsome ram. So death is going to come in the form of Khabashan uh, Amla. Uh, handsome ram and there's handsome ram that is going to be in the sight of the Jannatis and the sight of the Ahlanar, the people of the five Jahannam will be standing there فَيُقَالُوا it will be said يَا أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ هَلْ تَعْرِفُونَ هَذَا so Allah is going to ask the Jannatis, so Jannatis, do you recognize this, this Ram here? Do you recognize this handsome Ram? We in the Runa, they are going to turn and they are going to look at it and they are going to say, Naam had al-Maut. They are going to say, yes, this is death. 
Yes, this is that. They're going to recognize that in the form of the Ram. And similarly, Allah is going to call out to the people of the five Jahannam and say the same thing. Do you recognize this accomplishing Amla, this handsome Ram? They're going to look at it and they're going to say, yes, this is Nam, Had al Mount. This is death. And then it is going to be Fayyad Bahu. It is going to be sacrifice. And as Allah calls it to be sacrifice, it is going to be say, Ya Ahlul Jannah, Khuludan Wala Maut. When Jannah is Khulud, you're going to be there forever. Wala Maut. There's no death for you. Ya Ahlul Nar, Khuludan La Maut. You're going to be there forever as well. Ahlul Nar, the people of the fire of Jahannam, going to be there forever. La Maut. And then the Prophet, after mentioning this hadith of death, being getting um, death was going to be no more there. The Prophet sallallahu recited this ayah, recited the same ayah. Wa andar yom al wa andar hum yom al hasrati if kud yal amr hum fi ghaflati wa hum la yuminun. The next ayah, Allah says, Inna nahnu narithu al arda wa man alayna alayha wa ilayna yurjaun. Allah says, it is we who will inherit the earth and everyone on it. And to us, they will be returned. So Allah is telling us that He is the Falik, He is the Creator. He is the Malik. Allah is the owner. Allah is Al Mutasarrif. Allah is the controller. The creation, all of them, as we know, is going to be destroyed one day. Everything is going to be destroyed. And as the entire creation is destroyed, only only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to remain. Because Allah is the owner of everything. Allah just allowed us on the earth. And sometimes we feel because of some power that we might have, some authority or some wealth, we feel that we own it. We do not own it. We are going to die. And as you die, you go away. It is not yours again. You have six, seven, eight acres of land. When, when you die, that does not belong to you again. It goes on to your children. Your children die. That does not belong to them again. It goes down to somewhere else and like that. Until Everyone is destroyed. And when everyone is destroyed, the real owner takes it back, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the real owner. He was the controller from even the beginning. So Allah says, Inna nahnu earth, We will inherit the earth. We have allowed you to live. Allah has given, us, given it to us for a period of time. But a time is going to come and Allah is going to take it back. Waman alayha and whatever is on it. Every single thing that is on the face of the earth belongs to Allah. Wa ilayna yurja'un. And then Allah says to us is your return. All of us have to return to Allah. So we need to, to think well. As we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what am I taking as I return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not what you have here, not what you feel that you own at the moment, but ask yourself when everything is inherited by Allah, when Allah takes back everything, Allah takes back the whole dunya, Allah takes back the whole earth, the whole earth, what? Are you taking back to Allah when you return to Allah? This is the most important question. Because if we like it or not, we're heading to that direction. Every day, every new day, we're getting closer and closer to that time. Right now as you are alive, this is the time of Amal, this is the time of action. Because as you die, there's no action there. There's no salat in the grave. There's no recitation of Quran in the grave. 
There's no daycare, there's no fasting in the grave. So when you die, you go there, everything stopped. So whatever actions, whatever you want to take back when you return to Allah, you have to utilize the time now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. Next ayat, which is verse number 41, starts off with another prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so far in Surah Maryam, we did Prophet Zachariah and Prophet Yahya. So, Prophet Zachariah and Prophet Yahya together. And then we did Maryam and Jesus alayhi salam. So we have completed those four. Now from verse 41, we're going to deal with Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And as we can see, Zachariah, Yahya, Maryam, as well as Jesus alayhi salam, all of that was with regards to Ahlul Kitab. Because it was correcting what miss <coughs> information and misbelief that the Ahlul Kitab have about Zakaria, about Jesus alayhi salam, about Maryam alayhi salam. Now we move on to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it is important because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, the type of people that he is encountering, that he has to give the message to, you have the Mushrikeen, of Makkah, those who are idol worshippers, and then you have the Ahlul Kitab, which were the Jews and the Christians. So the beginning of the surah dealt with the Jews and the Christians, correcting their beliefs. Now we have Ibrahim Alaysa, which is going to try to correct the beliefs of the idol worshippers. Because these idol worshippers of Makkah they are from the lineage of Ibrahim salam. So they used to claim that their teachings have come from Ibrahim salam because that is where the Kaaba was. And we know the Kaaba was built by Ibrahim salam and Ismail. Yet they were worshipping idols. Yet all their actions were different from what Ibrahim salam struggled he struggled, he fight, he sacrificed just so that those same actions, he could get rid of those actions. He had to sacrifice his companionship with his father, his people, and everyone just because they were doing the actions that the same Mushrikun of Makkah are doing, which was idol worshiping. And yet these idol worshippers now are claiming that is the idol worshippers of Makkah. They are claiming that we are following the Millah of Ibrahim salam, which means that they are going against <laughs> the same thing that he struggled his whole life to get rid of. They have implemented it and now attributing it to Ibrahim salam. So Allah is going to tell us about Ibrahim salam and this in this section of the Quran that Allah tells us of Ibrahim, He tells us of Ibrahim's dawah to his father. Throughout the Quran, you will see different passages. And in one story, you're going to see the passage that dealt with him breaking the idols. One, the next passage you're going to see in another surah where they threw him into the fire. Another passage you're going to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about him looking at the stars and saying, Hada Rabbi, looking at the moon, saying, Hada Rabbi, looking at the sun, saying, Hada Rabbi, Hada Akbar. A different passage. You're going to see another passage that's going to tell us of when Allah commanded him to sacrifice his son, Ismail alayhi salam. So they are spaced out in the Quran. It is not together. But in Surah Maria, we're going to deal with his, that is Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
his dawa towards his father. That is what a passage in Surah Maryam will deal about. So we're not going to go off track and talk about him sacrificing his son and the story, the other stories. We're going to just stick to the dawa between Ibrahim salam and his father, who was an idol worshiper. So we're going to deal with mostly that. We're going to leave the other things aside until, inshallah, we reach those different passages. Then we're going to deal with those. So Allah begins, He says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Ibrahim And mention in the scripture, Ibrahim As you mentioned, uh, when the, the word kitab here refers to the Quran. So Allah is saying to the Prophet وسلم, mention that in this Quran is the story of Ibrahim. Mention the story of Ibrahim in the Quran. And some of the opinion that Kitab refers to this Surah, which is Surah Maryam. So mention in this full Kitab refers to the chapter, right? mention in this chapter the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Innahu kana siddiqan nabiyya. Allah says, certainly he was a man of truth, a prophet. So two attributes Allah have placed for Ibrahim alayhi salam. One is Siddiq. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was truthful. And the second, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was a Nabi. He was a prophet. So Ibrahim alayhi salam being truthful. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected all the prophets that he has chosen. And as he has protected them, he has protected them from sins. And this is why Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamal, we have the opinion that the prophets do not commit sins because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special protection towards these prophets. So they are sinless. That is only for the prophets and the Rasuls. So Allah says he was a Siddiq, he was truthful, and he was a prophet. Now during his time was filled with idol worshiping. There was a lot of idol worship. And there's a, a hadith, one hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which tells us that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he always spoke the truth illa thalatha kadhab, except for three lies. So it is mentioned in one hadith, Except three times, he made statements that outwardly looked as if it were lies. But as you analyze it, you realize that it is not really lies that will bring about sins. Because again, Allah protected the prophets from sins. And those three times, one was when he said, Inni Saqib, he says, I am sick. So as his father came, and asked him to go out on the day of the festival. He did not want to go because his intention was to go by the temple and destroy the idols. So because he did not want to go, he had to make an excuse. So he said, Inni Saqib, I am sick. So outwardly, some will say, that is a lie by saying, I am sick. When he was healthy, he was healthy enough to go and break the idols, yet he said, Inni Saqib, certainly I am sick. The second is when he said, when they asked him, O oh Ibrahim, did you break the idols? And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, the big one did it. Ask him. The big one did it. Out really again, songs as a lie. Because he knew he did it. But he did not say, I did it. He says, the big one did it. So ask him. So outwardly, again, looks as if it's a lie. And then as he and his wife, Sarah, was migrating, and they reached the tyrant. Some say that tyrant was Namrud. He said to Sarah, if the tyrant asks you, 
how you're related to me, say that you're my sister. Don't say that you're my wife. Because if you say you're my wife, he might want you and he might kill me. Because he's a tyrant. So do not say that we are married. Just say, two of us are, you're my sister. So again, we know, he knows that that is his wife, but he's telling her to say that she is his sister instead of his wife. Now, as we look at all three of the times where Ibrahim salam outwardly spoke a lie, the first, <coughs> when he says, Inni Sakim, says, I am sick. One is, it can be physically sick, it can be spiritually sick. So I, it, is, it could be as a means of not physically sick, even though his father would have taken it to mean that he's physically sick, could have mean that he's saying, I'm sick of shirk, I'm sick of idol worshiping. In this Hakim, I'm sick. Also, it is mentioned that when you're invited to a place, and sometimes when you don't have the mood to go, Say not, I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling well to go there. Not that you're, you're sick, you're not sick, but you just say not, you're not in the mood. They say, I'm not feeling well to go there. So it is as if he was saying that, but outwardly his father thought that he was actually physically sick. So that will clarify the first one that outwardly looked as a lie, but it was not really a lie. The second was when he said to uh, the people that the big one did. He knew that the people know that the big one didn't do it. So it's not that he was saying a lie for them to believe. He knew that they are not going to believe that. Nobody is going to believe that the big idol broke the other small idols. They are not going to believe that. He knows that they are not going to believe that. But he said that as a form of sarcasm, not as a form of lying. A form of sarcasm so that they will realize their falsehood, their battle. So this is why he said the big one did it, as a form of sarcasm. So it was not an actual lie that he mentioned there. And the third time when he told his wife to say that she is his sister. One is, it is mentioned by some that when he said that, he was talking general, as in, you're my sister in Islam. My sister in Islam, not my blood sister. But the tyrant would have taught himself that they are blood related, but he was just saying, you're my sister in because all Muslims, they are brothers with Iman. As long as you have Iman, you're brothers and sisters of that religion. So you're my sister. So when you really analyze it, he did not speak any lies. Even all three that looks as if he had spoken lies, it was not really lie because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had protected him. So Allah says, Inna hukana siddiqan nabiyya. Verse 42, he starts, so he approaches his father. Now, he's young, his father is old. Ibrahim alayhi salam have a lot of respect for his father. Also, a lot of love for his father. Even though... <coughs> Even though his father was an idol worshipper, his father was very loving and kind to Ibrahim <laughs> There is no narrations or no scenes of anyone that would attribute harshness of Ibrahim father towards Ibrahim during his child. So, father and son, both love each other. Father loves his son, the son loves his father, the father 
he's fulfilling his duty towards his son by caring for him, ensuring he provides for his son, providing love for his son. So he was everything as any other father would do. So there was this deep type of love between Ibrahim and his father. So at no point of time, now the revelation has come to Ibrahim he is being commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have to invite your father. You have to invite your father. And sometimes we as Muslims, we have fathers, sometimes we have mothers, we have siblings who are not Muslim. Yet there is this love that we have for them. But yet we think of how could I approach them without them disliking me. Without I trying to push them away, or without them pushing me away, or having this kind of bad vibes between us. So similarly, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had that connection of love between himself and his father. He didn't want to, to ruin that as well. But again, at the same time, as a prophet of Allah, he's been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have to invite your father. You have to give your father the message. And his father was an idol worshipper, not only an idol worshipper, but his father was in the business of making and selling idols. So he was deep in it. That is where he got all his income from, making and selling idols. Anybody want idols, they would come to him and purchase idols. He would carve the idols and sell it to them. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah tells us in verse 42, Ibrahim, he came to his father, if Paula li abihi, he said to his father, Ya abati, Ya abati. And you're going to see all, every single verse that Ibrahim alayhi salam gives as a form of dawah to his father, he starts with Ya Abati. Starts with that. And Ya Abati in Arabic means, Oh my beloved father. Oh my respected father. Oh my loving father. So out of love and respect, he's addressing him, showing the amount of love that he has for his father. The amount of respect. Oh Ya Abati. Oh my love and father, I'm going to tell you something now, Ya Abati. Lima ta'budu ma la yasma wa la yubsiru wa la yubni anka shayta. You're going to also see throughout these lines, not one time did Ibrahim alayhi salam call his father a kafir. Not one time. Not one time did he use any, any word of harshness towards his father. Because at the end of the day, he still has that love for his father. And it is a must that he shows certain respect towards his father. Which teaches us, we have parents. And sometimes as we give them the dao, we start to, <coughs> we start to handle them. And when they don't want to listen, we start to even call them names and things. And we start to tell him, you know what, if you don't think you're going in the fire, the fire, Jahannam, and this and that. Ibrahim alayhi salam was not like that. Not one time he said to his father, oh, my father, you are an infidel. You are a kafir, you are a Jahannami. Not one time. So he says, Lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yubsiru wa la yubni an kashaya. Very softly. He says, why do you worship what can neither hear nor see nor benefit you in any way? So he's saying, oh my father, why are you worshiping these things that cannot see? They cannot see. They cannot see as you prostrate to them. They cannot see as you're doing ibadah to them. They cannot see anything. La yasmo, they cannot hear. Whenever you're raising your hands and begging them for things, they can't hear you. Wala yukni an kashaya, my father, why are you worshipping these idols that 
La yugni and kashayakra cannot help you. So these idols cannot help you. So why are you worshipping these idols? La yugni and kashaya. So he's reasoning with his father. Trying to make him open his eyes. No disrespect at all. Trying his best not to have any disrespect for his father. But at the same time, ensure he delivers the message. And this is what, whenever you're given Dao, you have to have wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, instead of drawing people closer, you're going to push them away. And this is, this few ayahs that we're going to do are going to show us the way how Ibrahim went about it with his own father. So as whenever we are going to approach a relative, we should know to be gentle with them as well, to be loving, respectful to them. At the same time, inform them of the haq and the truth. So this is for us for to do, which is the first line of the dawah that Ibrahim alayhi salam gave to his father. Inshallah, next in our next session we'll continue the dawah of Ibrahim alayhi salam towards his father. We will continue from verse 43, inshallah. So with that we end tonight. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, Subhanallah, huma bihamdik. Shalom, <laughs> <laughs>